All right. Good morning, everyone. Just giving everyone a chance to connect to their audio. All right. Well, good af good morning, everyone. It's not afternoon yet. <laughs> welcome to the San Francisco Interfaith Council's weekly online briefing for faith leaders. Today, we welcome Mary Ellen Carroll, Executive Director of the San Francisco Department of Emergency Management. Today's event is hosted by the San Francisco Interfaith Council and supported by the Joint Information Center of the San Francisco COVID Command Center. Some housekeeping for today. Audio, video, and chat will be monitored and recorded for record keeping, training, and quality assurance. By default, all participants will be muted and video turned off to minimize distractions. For chat, to submit a question or comment, select the chat button at the bottom of your screen and send a message to Q&A. They will be shared with the speakers and panelists after the meeting for response. Thank you. You can save lives and stop the spread of COVID-19 by getting tested through your healthcare provider. If you have symptoms or have been exposed to COVID-19, but don't have health insurance or can't get tested through your provider, visit ff.gov slash get tested SF or call 311 for information on getting tested at a city run testing location. A safe and effective COVID-19 vaccine coupled with continued preventative measures are our best tools to end the COVID-19 pandemic and safely reopen San Francisco. Go to sf.gov slash COVID vaccine for information on eligibility, vaccination sites, including locations, and links to book appointments if available. And at this time, I'd like to hand the floor over to the Executive Director of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, Michael Pappas. Michael, the floor is yours. Elisa, thank you so much. And thank you to the wonderful team at the COVID Command Center's Joint Information Center Virtual Outreach Team. Uh, as we celebrate 40 programs together, uh, it's quite a monumental time for us and we couldn't do it without you and without this platform that you provide us. Uh, my name is Michael Pappas and on behalf of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, I wanna welcome you to this week's online briefing for faith leaders. After more than a year of responding, to the coronavirus pandemic, San Francisco Department of Emergency Management Executive Director, Mary Ellen Carroll, will give her perspective on the accomplishments of the COVID Command Center, provide the latest updates on the city's COVID response, and discuss rollout of the vaccine. Additionally, she will address the latest changes to faith-based in-person worship and recognize the valuable contributions of the city's faith-based partners, in particular, the San Francisco Interfaith Council. As February 25th marks the 40th weekly online briefing for faith leaders, making the SFIC the Joint Information Center's longest running virtual partner, we are particularly grateful that Director Carroll joins us as this program's featured presenter. At this time, and without further ado, it is my joy and privilege to welcome the chairman of the board of the San Francisco Interfaith Council, friend and colleague, Koshik Roy. Thank you so much, Michael. Good morning, everyone. As Michael mentioned, my name is Koshik and on behalf of the board, it is my pleasure to extend a warm welcome to all of you and thank you for uh, joining us. Uh, almost a year ago, I'm not sure Michael could have imagined when we did our first one of these conversations that this is where we would be at the end of February 2021 uh, with 39 of these under our belts. But it really is an incredible testament to both Michael and his uh, partner in crime, Cynthia Zambucas. So I always want to make sure I acknowledge all of the work and efforts uh, they have been doing, especially over this time. We have a two-person staff, but I'm very comfortable in saying that they accomplish much more than much larger staff. So thank you, Michael and Cynthia. I also want to, on a personal note, uh, thank Mary Ellen and say that I'm really looking forward to this conversation in particular. Obviously, uh, the Interfaith Council has benefited greatly uh, from the department. Uh, Mary Ellen oversees, and we're very appreciative of that. And if for just a moment, I can also put my other hat on, my Shanti Project hat on. We've also worked closely with the um, CCC uh, during the pandemic. 
working to provide emergency support to newly quarantined and diagnosed San Franciscans. So I've had a unique insight to see just how much uh, the department has had to hold and how wonderfully they've been able to do so. So thank you to all the guests for joining us. For those of us who are joining us for the first time, I wanna uh, extend a special welcome to all of you. I hope this will not be your last time joining us. Uh, at the beginning of every Interfaith Council event or meeting, we do have an interfaith statement we like to read. It's just a way for us to take a moment uh, to ground ourselves and remind ourselves uh, why we're gathered here. This is an interfaith community. Whatever our individual belief, it can be freely expressed here with no apologies. If we are invited to offer a prayer in this setting, it should be offered according to the tradition with which we identify. If we are invited to speak on a subject from the perspective of our tradition, we are free to do so without fear of offending those who come from another tradition. We come together as people of faith to learn from each other that we might better understand the multiplicity of faith traditions in our city and in our world. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Koshik, and thank you for your continued leadership and commitment to this program. Uh, uh, your consistency has been a great comfort to me personally, uh, and I know to all of those who are online attending. Um, it is a great joy to welcome uh, Pastor Megan Rohr. She's the pastor of Grace Lutheran Church, but so much more. She's been involved with the night ministry, uh, and she's been involved with our work in disaster preparedness, uh, as well as chaplaincy to the police department. Uh, she is a friend and a colleague and one well known throughout the city. And so without further ado, we welcome Pastor Megan to ground us in a reflective moment. Before I begin, I wanna uh, let people know that the windows behind me, um, each strand of string, uh, represents a thousand people who have died from the coronavirus worldwide. Um, and the, the intentional diversity of color of those strands reminds us that those who are people of color are the most impacted by this disease. 2.5 million people have died from the coronavirus worldwide. 506,000 have died in the United States. And 3,210 of those individuals died yesterday. So I ask that we begin with a moment of silence to remember all who have died. God of our weary years and God of our silent tears be with all who grieve due to coronavirus, addiction, poverty and homelessness. We pray especially for the Latinx community who has been disproportionately impacted by the coronavirus. Bless all who work in hospice, the medical examiner's office, at funeral homes and all who care for those who mourn. Be with those who are weary, anxious and fearful in these turbulent times. Strengthen our mental health and ease the path between the care people need and the care people can access. We pray especially for those among us who excel in caring for others around them, but find it difficult to, help, to accept help personally. Bring us rest and renewal, meaningful time off and Sabbath to all who need it. God of unstoppable justice, Untangle us from systems of oppression and biases that keep us from loving our neighbor as you love us. We pray especially for an end to gun violence that regularly threatens the safety of residents of the Bayview and Tenderloin, and for those who have encountered hate, including the Asian Pacific Islander and LGBTQ communities. We lift up prayers of Thanksgiving today for the San Francisco Department of Emergency Management. Be with dispatchers, first and second responders, chaplains, victim advocates, those triaging care for those living without housing, and all who respond to the emergent needs of those in crisis. Be with those managing vaccination centers and help all who are able to be vaccinated as quickly and safely as possible. Bring your blessings 
to all in healthcare prof professions, emergency workers and the volunteers who are supporting people during this time. Bless those who oversee data, FEMA paperwork and all the difficult tasks that support our city outside of the public eye. We pray especially for those who handle public messaging, community feedback and alerts. Strengthen the wisdom of DEM's leaders and grant them the ability to disconnect between emergencies and to have as much quality time as they can with those they value the most. And please bless our time together today so that trust may abound and the meditations of our heart may manifest peace throughout our beloved San Francisco. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Megan, and continue to pray for us. The San Francisco Interfaith Council was called into existence in part by city government uh, as a response to two crises, an emerging homeless crisis and the Loma Prieta earthquake. So as a result, uh, disaster response and preparedness uh, have, and recovery have been in our DNA. We've worked very closely with the Department of Emergency Management over the years in planning disaster preparedness workshops for congregations, identifying emergency shelters and cooling stations during heat wave. Um, <clears throat> and we've worked together in response to the regional response to the North Bay fires and security and houses of worship. Uh, that relationship is, is, a, is a cherished and an important relationship for the San Francisco Interfaith Council. Uh, a little more than <clears throat> a year and change after she was appointed uh, as the director of the Department of Emergency Management, uh, our director, Mary Ellen Carroll, I, I'll call it a baptism by fire, um, was thrust into this role of uh, of helping to coordinate the city's response to, to a crisis that none of us ever imagined. Uh, it is said that people define themselves in times of crisis and Mary Ellen has done that. We are very, very grateful for her tireless efforts and uh, she brings to her job compassion of the heart and um, discernment and we continue to pray for her every day. Uh, a year ago today, I remember vividly uh, sitting at the EOC, the Emergency Operations Center, when uh, she uh, led us in what was going to be the city's response to this crisis. We took very seriously, the Interfaith Council, uh, the, the challenge that was before us and uh, we have tried to be a good partner in that work. Today marks our 40th anniversary of programs that have been uh, provided by the Department of Emergency Management's COVID Command Center. And I just wanna to say to Mary Ellen, friend, colleague, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, it's, it's a blessing to have you with us today. You're among family and the floor is yours. Well, um, I have to say, I'm pulling myself together a little bit um, after all of your kind words and especially um, Pastor Megan's uh, prayer uh, definitely um, I, I, I touched me. Um, so give me a second. Um, I, I do wanna also I want to thank all of you. First of all, you have been incredible partners, not only in the last year, but, you know, for, for many years in the past, um, certainly from the beginning of my appointment here and before then. And I'll share on a personal level that um, if I did not have my spiritual practice has has gotten me through this year and helps to guide me every day um, to uh, both make the right decisions um, and, and also to stay strong and uh, to help lead the city. Uh, I wasn't, this isn't part of my written remarks um, and I'll get to those in a second. Um, 
the fact that I am in this position at this time is the most humbling, uh, you know, humbling honor for me and really the privilege of a lifetime. And frankly, the thing that is the most inspiring is all of the people uh, that, that, that quite frankly, Pastor Megan did an, an, just a, a, a brilliant job of encompassing this many, many people in the many areas that we, uh, that have been involved in this. And I don't know that there is a human among us, probably certainly in San Francisco and this country, perhaps the world that has not been affected by this global pandemic. And, um, you know, it has changed us certainly. And I, and I hope that, you know, um, I, I believe that for many of us, it has deepened our spiritual practice. And so, you know, just know how important that is um, and the incredible role that you all play. So um, apologies uh, for the tears, <laughs> but um, you, you really uh, had did such a beautiful job in your introductions and it, and it definitely touched me, so thank you. So uh, back, to, back to my, uh, <laughs> my regular speaking notes. So I'm Mary Ellen Carroll, I'm the director of the Department of Emergency Management. And I wanna thank you for inviting me here today. Um, you know, in we had our first in briefing, um, in briefing before we went virtual um, at uh, at St. Mary's for for the faith leaders, and um, and I don't know if it was the first one, but I think it was probably in the top three of the briefings that we did around COVID command around COVID uh, before that. I think it was probably still Corona at that point before it even became COVID. I mention this because it really demonstrates the commitment and compassion of our communities of faith. We didn't know at the time what was to come, but we knew we had to come together uh, to keep our friends, our family, and our neighbors safe and healthy. So um, I also want to acknowledge that it was a year ago today, um, I think Michael mentioned that we declared uh, an emergency in San Francisco, literally to, to the date. Um, this was before we had a confirmed case uh, in San Francisco. And so a lot of people were like, what, you know, that was a big question. Why were we declaring an emergency before we had the case? And the reason is that we knew that we had to unlock the full resources of the city in order to respond to this mysterious virus, which was taking, making its, our, it, its way to us. And, you know, this is part of what we've been preparing for any emergency. We don't just prepare for earthquakes, um, but for any emergency, a key concept is leaning forward. And um, while it was scary and upsetting to a lot of people, we did that. I think we know now, obviously it was the right thing to do. Um, we had activated our emergency operations center a month earlier on January 27th, which happens to be my birthday, which is now also an anniversary that I will never forget. Um, and in our planning and our preparedness efforts, uh, we knew we had to mobilize those resources. Um, this slide is, um, this is my team um, here and uh, they, are, um, they are the people that um, bring me to tears on the regular and really have, um, have uh, have come together to lead this lead this uh, organization. So some of the things that we did to lean forward um, and some of our accomplishments, our testing program is one of the leading programs in the country. We lead pretty much most every city in the country per capita, we have done more tests. We have done, we have obtained uh, thousands of isolation and quarantine rooms. We have worked with our community partners and placed thousands of people in these rooms, uh, uh, thousands of people in, um, who are experiencing homelessness in shelter and place hotel units. Uh, we have purchased and distributed millions of units of personal protective equipment, otherwise known as PPE. We set up a food security program that has delivered 1.4 million meals through the Great Plates program, 1.9 million bags of groceries in partnership with the food bank. It's incredible. Um, our food program has also been a national model and many of you were very involved in that. We've distributed and 
um, developed multilingual health and safety throughout uh, information throughout San Francisco. And, you know, we have um, developed and strengthened partnerships with communities that have been hit hard by the virus. Um, we have been here for 395 days. Um, and I am so proud of the work that not only this group of people that you see here, but really thousands of city workers um, who, by the way, have not stayed home and been safe, but have left their home and, um, you know, risk their own safety to, to continue to work. And that's not only people who work in COVID command, but those are the bus drivers, um, our healthcare workers, obviously, uh, our public works folks who are out, you know, cleaning the streets um, and all the other people that quite frankly, also uh, Pastor Megan really describes so aptly. So, um, and what have you, and you all have been a huge partner in this too. You've collected and distributed that PPE I talked about to our communities in need. You have supported those food security programs. You have set up winter shelters for people experiencing homelessness, found creative ways to offer spiritual services. And to my earlier points, how, just to underscore how important that is, more important than ever in these difficult times and really served as a conduit to share this critical health and safety information to your congregations. Um, and finally, you've really have been an example of what happens when people come together to take care of one another. So what has come to mind often and what we talk about often in our department is like, just imagine for a minute what we have learned and how that's going to affect us in future emergencies and disasters. And none of us ha have the bandwidth probably to think about that much. Um, and you don't have to worry, I think about it for you. Um, but it's true. And you know, the silver lining of, of this um, is, and, and I believe that in spite of all the losses, there is, there is a silver lining and there are things that are good that will come out of this. And this is that, um, that we will be so much better in our response uh, the next time that we have to activate. So as we move on to the next slide, um, I'm going to talk up to you a little bit about um, where we stand right now. So as you can see in this slide, as of this week, um, we've had more than 33,000 cases. Um, and of those cases, we mourn 394 San Franciscans who have lost their lives. We're currently averaging 79 cases a day, new cases, and we are testing more than 5,600 people a day. Um, and right now we still have more than 90 people currently hospitalized in San Francisco with COVID-19. So that's where we are right now. Um, the good news is that we have weathered the winter storm. We got through it. Um, and that, that surge, as you can see here, was more than double the spring and summer surges. Um, and at our peak, we are at 375 new cases a day, and now we're at 79, just as a comparison. Um, we did this because we were prepared. Uh, we did this because we've been in this enduring uh, response and that we have learned lessons along the way over the last year um, and that we have we continue to be proactive um, and, and take the measures that we know um, will save lives. So while we flatten this curve, we have more work to do because our case rate does remain high. Um, our goal is to have uh, less than 1.8 uh, cases per 100,000 and more at nine. So we have a little way to go. Earlier this week, San Francisco um, lifted the mandatory quarantine order, but we're still, we're urging people still to avoid non-essential travel outside the Bay Area. And we recommend that people do quarantine if they do, uh, for 10 days, if they do leave the state. Um, this is a positive development, but we're not out of the woods. We have to continue to take precautions. We have to wear our masks. We have to, um, continue to uh, not congregate uh, in, in large groups uh, together inside. We're in the purple tier, although we think we're gonna be moving to the red probably next week. Um, and while you know, I can't stress enough that the virus is still very, very widespread in our city and we have beaten back another surge, but it is still here with us and we have to be vigilant. 
So yesterday, another good news, we opened up phase 1B of the state's fax plan, and that means that workers who work in food and agriculture, education and child care, and emergency services are now eligible to receive the vaccine. For me, this is incredibly personal. That includes every single one of the staff that work for me um, and all of the people that have been on the ground in COVID command. The food and ag workers, uh, for us, it's mostly food, not so much ag, but that includes the restaurant workers, the folks that work in groceries who never stopped working, did not stay home, and as we know, have been disproportionately affected. So I yesterday was a, a very happy day for me. Um, I felt joy in my heart that we were going to finally get um, these folks uh, moving forward. And then of course, education, many, many childcare workers also have been taking care of all of our children as we came to work and teachers, as we know, um, we, we know teachers want to, and we want to get teachers back in the classroom because our children need to be there. So, um, so within this, this 1B, uh, we have many hard to reach uh, populations, undocumented folks, informal workers, non-English speakers, um, and people with many other barriers. We are planning on addressing this through targeted, very culturally competent outreach in partnership with the same community-based organizations that San Francisco has already partnered with to provide low barrier access to testing and vaccines. Um, and throughout this transition to 1B, we'll continue focusing on ensuring vaccine access to those who are over 65, because those people truly are at the highest risk. So currently um, within 1A, we have vaccinated over 80% of 1A and about 50, and within that uh, 1A is healthcare workers and people over 65. The, of the group over 65, we think we va vaccinated about 57% of that group. Um, uh, with first vaccine. So that means 43% of those folks still haven't received their vaccine. They are still high risk and we still need to get that vaccine pushed out to them. Many of these people we know are going to include people with barriers such as limited mobility, not don't have access to technology, a computer, don't have computer lit literacy or with uh, language limitations. So this is why, again, we go to the folks that have helped us from the beginning, and that's groups like you, our community partners, and our healthcare providers who provide services to this group. Um, you know, the fact is, we know that there are certain groups that are going to be able to uh, not work the system in a negative way, but you know, they're going to have easy access to figure out how to do this. I myself have, you know had to help family members who were over 65, who would, know, you know, would never probably have been able to access the, the resources and the vaccine themselves. So I, I know how important this is and not everyone has a daughter or a niece um, to, to like myself to help them through. So finally, um, we're at the end, we think of this long tunnel. I know I see and I feel the light. And, and I just wanna say to all of you, you know, what my spiritual practice tells me is that we are the light. And um, all of you have shown so brightly for our city and I am eternally grateful to all of you. So, um, I want to turn this over to Michael, and I think we're going to go into some questions. We are indeed, Mary Ellen, and I just wanted to say your tears and your sincerity, uh, your discernment, your prudence, and your wisdom have been the most valuable expression of San Francisco values, and for that we are all grateful. Um, continue on, and we continue to partner and journey with you uh, through this pandemic to the light. Uh, when people think about the religious community in San Francisco, I think primarily they think about the houses of worship. Uh, our constituencies though here in San Francisco are far broader. Uh, there are 800 uh, communities of worship and religious institutions in San Francisco. Yes, we have the communities of worship. In addition though, we uh, work very closely with the academic and healthcare institutions that have religious affiliation as well as 
the faith-based social service agencies that are really providing the safety net uh, for our city's most vulnerable residents. Today, I'd like to, for those of you who've never heard the term, I'd like to uh, help you expand your vocabulary. Uh, and here's a word, it's called judicatory. And adjudicatory is a larger organization, an umbrella, if you will, uh, that has responsibility for a number of, uh, of, of communities of worship under its umbrella. Uh, for instance, the Archdiocese of San Francisco, the, uh, uh, the Jewish Federation, uh, Northern California Board of Rabbis, um, uh, the Episcopal Diocese of, of, of California. Many of them are headquartered here, but have a regional scope. We have been working very, very closely with, uh, with the, their directors of security uh, on, on all kinds of different issues uh, re related to disaster preparedness, response, and recovery. We are very blessed to have three of them with us today who will comprise uh, our, what we call the faith panels, panelists. And so I'm going to introduce them one at a time, and they're going to give a, a brief five-minute uh, uh, overview of how they have been uh, doing disaster work within, uh, their, uh, within their communities of faith. Um, and then they're gonna pose a question to our director. Uh, I did wanna say to the director, uh, I really credit the ability of our communities of faith to pivot so quickly to online worship and virtual ministry uh, to the uh, very, very important communications that your department has issued uh, I think it's, a, it's enabled our, uh, our bishops and, and heads of our judicatories to make informed decisions, as well as our faith leaders, on behalf of those in char uh, charged to their spiritual care. Uh, and so we continue to get that information out daily, um, and they continue to make decisions. And you've been very helpful, as well as getting clarity to some of the more complex uh, communications that have been sent out, as, as well as the public health orders. Let's begin with Raphael Brenner. Uh, the Jewish Community Federation and Endowment Fund's Director of Jewish Community Security. Uh, we've worked very closely on so many uh, uh, issues, Rafi, and I, the floor is yours to give us an overview of how you've approached response to this pandemic within the Jewish community in San Francisco. Thank you very much, Michael. It's really an honor to be here and, and humbling as well. Uh, it, it's mind-boggling when we realize it's been a year since the declaration of a state of emergency. Uh, it is mind boggling for me as well to read some of the emails that I sent out to partners and to staff at my organization a year ago uh, that explicitly said you do not need to wear a mask because that was the guidance that was coming out from CDC at the time. So we've learned so much in a year. Uh, we've, we've made mistakes, we've recovered, we've, um, you know, Mary Ellen, thank you so much for you know, sharing your compassion and, and feelings in the way you did, because that's that's really the the tip of the iceberg, I think, for all of us, that there's a, a primal scream underneath uh, everyone's existence this past year. Uh, as far as what we've been doing in, in the Jewish community, it's been to sustain organizations that obviously have lost their funding streams as they had to, to close or limit services. Uh, we've also been focused on uh, providing tips and advice on keeping video conferencing secure. Uh, that has been a, 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 you know, it's been a godsend that we can gather in that way virtually. And it has been an opportunity for those who uh, insist on attacking other communities. And there are many communities that have suffered Zoom bombings. And this is a recurrent thing. So it's not a matter of telling people to not let their guard down. It's, it's more a matter of reminding people to take the precautions so that especially our, our elderly, our, our isolated, aren't afflicted as well by people um, crashing these gatherings in horrible ways. Now, shifting from the challenges that we faced, now we're in this new environment where Vaccines are available, and how does that change the equation? Uh, in speaking to some of my colleagues in the community, the, in the houses of worship arena, there are raised expectations that now that especially the elderly are 
getting their vaccines. Well, can I come in and sit in the back while you're streaming services? You know, I've got my vaccine now. Uh, so in that environment, how do we manage those expectations? How do we accommodate people who are now relatively safer to move about? Uh, and I'm, I even hesitate to say relatively safer to move about because there's so many unknowns still. So my question goes in the direction of how how does this change the restrictions that we're facing? Um, can we legitimately discriminate between those who have been vaccinated and not been vaccinated? Uh, there are all sorts of new dilemmas that are opening up. Now I'm going to focus in on my specific question, which is in the Jewish community, we have our high holidays coming up in September. They coincide with Labor Day this year. Uh, Labor Day won the lottery. And the big question for Jewish congregations is what should we be planning for? Is it realistic to plan for indoor religious services by Labor Day? Now, I know that's kind of a yes, no question, and I expect you to hedge. <laughs> and in hedging, what I'd really like to know is what planning advice do you have for congregation leaders and administrators uh, in anticipation of what things will look like in September? We're working to get the director back on one moment. I can repeat my question as needed. Why don't you do that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Trey, is the director back on? Elisa, can you make Mary Ellen Carroll the co-host again? So Mary Ellen, sorry if I missed you on that last round. Okay, here we go. Sorry, I, I, was, I couldn't unmute myself, so. um, which many might think is a good thing at times, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so to answer your question, so is it too early? So my answer is yes, but that's like going to be more of a no. So is it too early to to assume that we can have indoor, yes, it is too early. Um, and it really is too early to plan to where we will be um, as of Labor Day. Um, but we do have some criteria by which you can be monitoring and doing some planning. So we are bound by the state's tiered reopening system. Um, and that gives us a roadmap of what reopening looks like for us, including indoor religious services. So, um, I, you know, we do anticipate that large indoor gatherings are going to be one of the, the last things that open. Um, so, you know, my advice is that we remain vigilant and smart. Um, we keep, uh, even as we vaccinate people, we have to keep in mind our collective behavior. So we need to continue to wear face coverings and practice social distancing. Um, Right now, um, we're at our, our indoor uh, worship is currently at 25% um, with some limitations. Um, the other thing is that you have to remember is that people who are vulnerable are still recommended not to participate in indoor gatherings, um, if at all possible. So I think we're going to have to um, outdoor religious um, activities are currently allowed without limitations. So again, I think we need to um, keep monitoring uh, the state guidelines. We will be here to provide you with information as it becomes available and changes. Um, and the fact is the more vigilant we remain over the coming months, the sooner we're gonna get to that place of uh, normalcy and the sooner we'll be able to come together again. Thank you for that question, uh, uh, Rafi, as well as for the response. I did want to mention that early on in this series, we did a, we did a particular uh, program and briefing on, on conducting Zoom calls with confidence. And the reason we have the whole registration process is because uh, we, uh, we were asked by Rafi uh, to be consistent and be good examples of what we're preaching. And so uh, that extra step that we take to register is uh, all about security. So I wanna, I wanna express that thanks to you um, uh, so that we can conduct these, these programs confidently. 
Uh, our next guest is uh, and panelist is Derek Gaskin. He is the director for the Department of Safety and Security, as well as Risk Management at the Archdiocese of San Francisco. I know the Archdiocese has a whole host of challenges as well as many, many uh, parishes and religious institutions in San Francisco. So we are looking forward, Derek, to uh, your comments as well as your question. Thank you, Michael, and thanks uh, to everybody uh, for sacrificing your time today. Uh, I too, very humble to be here and honored. Uh, before I dive into my short uh, sharing, I want to give special thanks, well-deserving thanks to uh, Mayor Breed and her office, uh, Michael Pappas, uh, as a friend and as a really good leader. Uh, Mary Ellen Carroll, good to see you and the entire SF Dem team. Uh, John McKnight, who runs the Faith-Based uh, Roundtable, uh, really great work. Uh, his uh, colleague, Hafiza, uh, Salabia, uh, Baya, and then all of the folks that actually dedicated their time today, and like I said, sacrificed their time. I'll dive right into it. So the Archdiocese, um, as challenging as it may be at times, uh, for those that don't know, we're in three counties, San Mateo, Marin, San Francisco. So the dynamics are extremely different. We have to deal with three different county Department of Public Health uh, offices. Uh, one of the things that helped us was setting up task force teams. Um, within the counties, in addition to within the chancery, our main office. Uh, we meet weekly, uh, every Monday. Uh, outside of that, we also have our safety coordinators per site, per location for schools and parishes. And we meet every Wednesday uh, to discuss the health orders per county. Not only that, to really share ideas on how do we actually manage and mitigate through this difficult health crisis. So that, that's been helping us uh, a lot. Uh, it's very unfortunate we lost a priest um, at one of our parishes that actually got exposed to the virus outside of the parish, uh, but came back to the parish and exposed others. Uh, that was unfortunately media coverage. So, you know, other than that, uh, I think we've been doing a phenomenal job uh, under the guidance of Archbishop Coy Leone, uh, who really, really supports and embraces uh, all county health orders. Um, in fact, I know his reopening uh, guidelines to the parishes, to the priests, were him suggesting, highly suggesting and recommending that we still celebrate mass outside, even though we can be inside at a 25% capacity. I mean, a day like today, you know, why wouldn't you celebrate mass outside? It's beautiful. Uh, so I know he's very, very in support of uh, each county's uh, requirements as it relates to uh, health orders. Um, I'm going to dive right into my questions. It's a two-part question, so it is really one question. And my question is based on past and present conversations surrounding past history dating back from 1932 through 1972 involving the Tuskegee, which a lot of us have heard and maybe some folks haven't. The uh, Tuskegee experiment, which African-American men were denied, denied medical treatment for syphilis until penicillin came on the line in the early 1940s. Uh, versus here we are today with this unfortunate health crisis, uh, the new year 2021, where severely uh, impacted communities of color have an opportunity to gain access, not being denied access, but gain access to COVID-19 vaccinations, but there's still bumps in the road in addition to hesitations. So my first part of my question is, what can the state of California and the county of San Francisco do to increase the trust and confidence in response and in support of deprived communities surrounding COVID-19? That's part one. Part two is what role could the Archdiocese of San Francisco play in making certain most impacted communities uh, can forgive based on past history in regards to treatment, access, education, communication, transparency, and follow through in hopes of receiving the vaccine treatment in a timely fashion. So, um, first of all, it's good to see you also, Derek. Um, I, you know, such really excellent question and so pertinent. Um, I, I, I want to just like say that one, I, I think that biggest lesson for me coming out of this and how I have changed the most in my professionally and just sort of how I will approach 
this work for as long as the, I'm doing it the rest of my life is around the issue of equity. Um, it is not part of traditional emergency response doctrine. Uh, there isn't an equity box in the ICS chart. There is now in San Francisco and it's high up there. But um, we learned a lot in the beginning of this. And um, I will say that we, I, I am proud of the work that we've done on vaccine and the way that we have approached it differently than we did with testing. So, you know, testing in some ways was a ramp up for vaccine. They're two different operations, but there's some similarities. Um, you know, we were, we opened large testing sites in um, predominantly white areas of the city, not intentionally, be, you know, not to say that that's, you know, we wanted to uh, serve, you know, white people only, but it was more around convenience and where we had space. Uh, when we went, uh, when we did vaccines, we opened our community, we opened our first uh, vaccine um, site in the mission before we did uh, our other mass vac sites. And we opened several Bayview sites at the same time we were opening other sites. So we pushed those first. We knew we had to focus on that. Our resources, our planning, and our operations went toward those. Um, so I think we are doing things differently. Um, are we doing them perfectly? Probably not. Um, we've, we're have learning as we go on, on all of this. Um, on the, how do we get, we already know, like we're already seeing the issue of um, different communities. Um, some of those are communities of color who are, are distrustful and hesitant um, around vaccine and have high declination rates of vaccine. Um, and honestly, like that is where we have to go to our trusted partners, the trusted messengers. People understandably don't trust government. And so we can't pretend like we're gonna, no matter, you know, no matter how much, how much icing you put on it or the bow or the way that you put it forward, it doesn't, you know, that's, that, that I'm not the right messenger for that. Um, and so those partnerships are so critical. You all are part of that. Um, the, the community branch within, within COVID command who has done just, I mean, I don't, I want to say hundreds, maybe there's been thousands by now, I don't know, of, of round tables that we've had to engage. And when we talk about DSWs and city workers who have done this, like I always try to, rem you know, remember that it's also our community partners <clears throat> that have been hand in hand with us in fighting this disease. And we have to continue that way. Um, just to speak to the equity part, um, our, uh, we, we had um, Shakira Smiley, who's now our um, director for the Office of Racial Equity for the city of San Francisco, um, came into the COVID command, even before it was COVID command, our EOC early, early on, and really, you know, helped us to help me to see the light who provided this equity lens because none of us had that, you know, or we, we didn't have it sufficiently. Um, and we've grown that team as we move forward. Um, before they were sort of consultory and now they are part of operations. Um, operations doesn't make decisions without equity team weighing in. So those are the ways in which we're, we're um, moving forward and, and trying to address this issue. But again, um, we've got to do this with partnerships. We have to do this with trusted uh, voices within community. Um, and, and that, that includes a lot of listening and not so much telling. So um, I think that's my second list, lesson, I think, of this whole thing is that as much as I'm a leader um, and I have to do a lot of make decisions and do a lot of directing, I have to have my ears open and my heart open. And I really have, have to listen as I move forward. So that's a long-winded answer to your question. It's a comprehensive response and an important response to an important question. Thank you to you both. Um, our final faith panelist is the Reverend Jane McDougall, who uh, for the Episcopal Diocese of California serves as the disaster response team lead, as well as the COVID response team uh, for the Bishop. Uh, Jane, would you uh, 
Tell us what's going on in the Diocese of California. Could you also share with us the, the reach of the Diocese of California? And, and I just would like to acknowledge also that, that Bishop Mark Andrus has been an incredible partner and leader in our interfaith work uh, here, as well as Archbishop Corte Leon and our, our, and our other faith leaders throughout the, the city. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Michael. So yes, the Diocese of California spans six counties and has 80 congregations, 16 of which are in the city of San Francisco. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking you, Michael, and the Interfaith Council for your tireless work in offering us such worthwhile programming, especially over the last 40 weeks, and in your prompt relaying of any new orders from the city. It's been, really been very useful. And thank you, Director Mary Ellen, Ellen Carroll for your presentation and for everything that the DM does for the city in this crisis. And I'm particularly grateful for the way the DM, DM has reached out to the faith community. We're all stronger and safer because of that. As our COVID-19 team response team has worked to translate the orders from the city for our congregations, we've insisted, as I know you all have, in making love the bottom line, love of neighbor, we see our worship spaces as places where families and friends might gather and we interpret the pandemic orders accordingly. Our doors remain shut, but like you, we've been anything but closed, exploring all avenues, both low tech and high tech. And we have worried, as I know you have, about how to keep engaged the zoomed out teenagers and the overly stressed families and our less technologically savvy elders. And I know we've all grieved at having to pause in so much of our hands-on work with the homeless and needy on the streets. Looking forward, our congregations have all submitted plans for how they will reopen safely when they do. But as we look at the next three months with projections from the scientific community, we think it unlikely that we will return to inside worship in the near future, except for very small funerals and weddings as allowed. Fortunately, it seems that most of our congregations are in agreement. I know that all of us on this call have been working so hard to keep our congregations spiritually nourished and safe. And while there have and continue to be challenges, I think there have also been silver linings. In the Episcopal Church, I think we had become lazy. And over the last 11 months, we've had to remember, 12 months, we've had to remember that the church is so much more than a building. Oh, like you, we have been creative. Well, maybe you haven't been messy, we've been messy, even inspired in our work. And it does seem like we're going to be so much stronger going forward. I do worry about the well being of clergy everywhere. We all know how exhausting this is being. And while it's great news that the city is vaccinating its educators, I do hope the city might consider also including clergy. Our work demands that we are spiritually and emotionally present to those in distress, grief, or at the end of life. And being at the end of a telephone or on a Zoom call doesn't do it. We need to be protected. But to my question, which with your permission, I ask of both directors, Mary Ellen and Michael, we all know that there is great need on the streets for spiritual and emotional care during times of crisis and great work is being done. Thank you, Megan Roth. Thank you, Margaret Dyer Chamberlain, San Francisco Night Ministry. And I know that there are many others out there. I believe there's a need for a coordinated city chaplaincy program, not dissimilar to NERT, where chaplains could receive training, be certified and be deployed during emergency situations and could have a seat and voice at the table. So my question is, could an interfaith chaplaincy program be developed under the umbrella of the Department of Emergency Management with support from the Interfaith Council? And if so, how can we make it happen? I'm glad to respond, but Mary Ellen, I, I will give you out of respect, certainly the floor first. Um, well, you know, I, I definitely um, want to to hear your response. I do want to say I, I agree 100%. It's spiritual care is absolutely essential during disasters. Um, and, uh, you know, a few years ago, we went up to the campfire after the campfire, we sent a team up there um, to support the town of Paradise's EOC. And every single one of them talked about the role of the chaplain that, that 
play during the DOC, the EOC. And I just want to say, um, so it has been on my to-do list to contact uh, you, Megan, and you, Michael, because I am really concerned about the trauma of our own staff. Um, you saw some of mine. <laughs> I gave you a little peak taste of that. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that not only during, immediately after, during, but then, you know, I think we have a situation here that is, that we're going to be needing to deal with. So I, I am, um, I want to start now. I, you know, I want to follow up to talk about how we take care of, um, and it's overwhelming. I think that's part, first of all, I've, you know, there's a lot happening. And it feels overwhelming to me um, because it's not just the dispatchers or people working in here. It is everyone. It's everyone. So, um, so yes, a hundred percent. Michael, please. So um, they say confession is good for the soul. Uh, I think before the North Bay fires, I was so myopic and just concentrating on all things San Francisco. What we learned during the North Bay fires, uh, I had received a call from your predecessor, Marianne uh, uh, and Cronenberg, as well as from the Salvation Army and from some uh, the Red Cross and some other folks wanting to know who our counterparts were up in Sonoma, as well as in Marin, where, uh, where uh, evacuees were presenting themselves. And uh, I, it dawned up on me, I had this epiphany that we really need to work regionally. Fortunately, in our work, we have our, my counterparts uh, and the executive directors of the Interfaith Council of some of our neighboring counties, we have a very good collegial and collaborative relationship. Uh, we actually had a debrief after the North Bay fires at the EOC uh, on Turk Street. And one of the things that came out of the conversation was this need to, to develop a curriculum and vet those who are going to be sent into uh, to vulnerable areas because there are vulnerable people in times of crisis. And so that we, we really need to develop that chaplaincy program. I think that uh, the conversation happened. We, uh, we followed up over at the Red Cross with, uh, on this program, uh, but I think everything kind of came to a halt when COVID uh, hit. Uh, it, your question and your appeal, uh, Jane, is, is an important one. Uh, and, and I am going to give you the pledge and, uh, and I'm going to also give Mary Ellen the pledge that we are fully committed uh, to working with you all on this. Fortunately, in Berkeley, there's a program called the Chaplaincy Program um, and uh, the Chaplaincy Institute, and they've agreed to, to assist us. And we also want to work with, um, with uh, those who are doing this work already to see what kind of curriculum, uh, curricula are out there uh, so that we can tailor something that is appropriate uh, to our work here in San Francisco and in our neighboring counties. I hope that that's a good response. No, that, that's great. And I just want to double down on the commitment. And, and quite frankly, I would love, to, I, I want to commit to following up with you immediately after this meeting. And I think that we have the opportunity, if people are what can carve out a little time to do this, that we can do some piloting right now um, to, to see how we um, do this. I, you know, a final just comment is that I think I mentioned it earlier. You know, we are so much more prepared because of this 14 month roller coaster ride we've been on. For some of us, it's been 14 because we were starting in December on this. But, um, and this is one of the ways that, you know, let's, there's no need to, I don't think we need to wait till this is over and the next thing. No, let's, let's try to do something now. So, um, Francis, my chief of staff is on here. Francis, let's set it up. I'm on it. I, um, this is a fantastic idea. Okay. Thank you. I know our time is coming to a close. I'm thinking back when I received my first mask um, and it was, I, I had been invited to, uh, to go to uh, Moscone to join the mayor and offering some remarks around the time of Eastern Passover. There was a concern that people were gonna be flocking to, to houses of worship during that time. 
And I realized that we had comfortably gotten to this point where we were really good at doing online uh, worship and virtual ministry. And so I used the opportunity uh, to, to commend our faith leaders uh, and I, I wanted to mention to the, to the, to the director, too, that uh, from all reports, uh, attendance at worship, uh, ironically, has been up, uh, and in many cases, giving has as well. I, I just wanted to tell you, the tears you shed earlier, I shed when I received a, a call from one of the associate pastors at Grace Cathedral just to check in to see how I was doing. I have been doing that uh, with our faith leaders because I know, uh, I know the burden that they are carrying. The one thing that struck me though, that when I descended the stage after the mayor's uh, uh, press conference uh, was the fact that those congregations that had the resources were doing really well. Those that didn't have the resources were struggling and their, their people might not have access to the internet or uh, so we, a priority for the Interfaith Council now is this issue of equity. Um, and we are very, very committed to that. That said, I would also say though, that there's another equity issue with online worship. And that is the fact that those people who could not go to worship, either because of illness or age um, or disability are now on the same par with those who, uh, uh, who normally would go. And I do not foresee that online worship is going to end after the pandemic. I think we've learned a lot of lessons and I don't think that we're gonna be going back to the old ways of doing things uh, in general in our city. But I'm just very proud of the communities of faith in our city and I wanna say thank you to them. And on this uh, 40th anniversary, I wanna say thank you, Director Carroll, uh, to you, to the DEM, to the COVID Command Center, uh, to your incredible team. Uh, we are grateful to, to, to John McKnight, uh, who has done just an incredible job uh, with the uh, Community Partners Group as coordinator, Trey Russell Allen for leading the virtual outreach team, and Elisa Karawala, our producer here, as well as Sharon Walton, who has been a key lead over the, over the many, many weeks. I would be remiss if I did not say a very special thank you uh, to Cynthia Zambucos, uh, the uh, program associate for the council. Uh, without her, uh, I, I, we, would, we would be at a loss. And so I, I'm thanking her for her commitment, ongoing commitment. Uh, we wanna thank all of the panelists who have joined us today and ask everybody to come and join us next week at this same time when we will welcome the San Francisco Department of Homelessness and Supportive Housing Acting Director, Abigail Stewart Kahn who will shine a light on the city's response to homelessness in these times of COVID-19. And so we, we encourage you all to come and join us next week. This concludes our program. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for sticking with us all of these uh, weeks and happy 40th anniversary. God bless you and God keep you. Thank you.